Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 285 of uh, Humanity Rising. Uh, if you can believe it, we've been going uh, since last May of May 22nd of 2020. Uh, our commitment was to roll out Humanity Rising as a daily opportunity for people to come together from all over the world for as long as the pandemic uh, lasted. Uh, little did we know uh, back in May of last year uh, that it would go on as long as it has. Uh, and as you all know, wherever you are uh, in the world, it is still with us. Uh, so humanity rising is still rising. So I just wanna open today by thanking everybody for all your support uh, over these months. Uh, now more than a year, we're broadcasting uh, each day over 30, 40 live uh, partner channels uh, to tens of thousands of people in over 130 countries. Uh, and the emails we get and the partners that we're forming and the ideas and solutions that are coming our way uh, inspire us uh, day by day with the, I would say, the simple human goodness that is out there and all the people all over the world uh, that 24-7, 365 are working their hearts out to ensure that the post-pandemic world uh, is more abundant, more healthy, uh, more regenerative, uh, because it's in alignment with natural systems. So thank you. I just wanted to start today with a big uh, word of thanks uh, to all of you who've made Humanity Rising uh, possible. Uh, let us begin, as we always do, by taking a moment and engaging in a collective coherence exercise. Place your awareness in your body, close your eyes, and place your attention on your heart. And for the next minute, attune yourself with your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude and deep thanksgiving that you're alive. We're all alive at this most extraordinary moment in the human journey. Thank you, everyone. And now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude and love for each and every one of you who are joining our session today, I want to recall first the discussion we had yesterday on Humanity Rising with Jean-Christophe Boss, a senior diplomat in the United Nations and the World Bank, uh, who'd been working with uh, major corporations and international institutions uh, for many, many decades uh, on the issue of how you connect people together to create peace, uh, who's launching 
uh, a new organization actually by that name, Connectors for Peace uh, in the fall uh, as his next iteration in his uh, inexorable crusade uh, to harmonize human relations at a time of deep social divisions. Today, we want to turn to the domain of economics, uh, which is probably uh, next to politics, the most divisive instrumentality by and through which humans organize their affairs. Uh, economics originally was uh, coined by the Greeks as what pertained to organizing a household. And of course, now it pertains to a neoliberal capitalist system uh, that completely dominates uh, the world with uh, some very important exceptions, uh, but which has been more divisive, uh, more destructive of environment and communities and probably any other economic system in the history of humankind and has brought the world uh, to the brink of uh, total catastrophe. Uh, if you read Naomi Klein, uh, you know, she believes that capitalism is at the root of the current civilizational uh, crisis. Uh, so today we want to turn to an economist uh, who has been uh, working like uh, Jean Krastoff uh, uh, we had yesterday uh, for a very long time on rethinking and reimagining what economics uh, can look like. As you all know, we've had uh, Kate Rayworth on Humanity Rising, and recently we had a whole course with Kate on donut economics, uh, and Hazel Henderson, who I'd like to introduce to you right now uh, is a kindred spirit. And in fact, I would say the godmother of, uh, of Kate uh, and uh, the new thinking that has uh, been percolating around our world um, uh, for the last uh, 30, 40 years as people have sought uh, to either reform uh, neoliberal uh, economics uh, in the Chicago School of Economics or replace it with an alternative uh, way of uh, understanding economics. And no one knows more about this uh, than Hazel Henderson, who's written many, many books. She has her own TV show uh, and has been at the forefront of a new economic thinking uh, for a very long time. So welcome to Humanity Rising, uh, Hazel. Hazel's now in Florida, uh, where she's been for many years. Uh, and Hazel, why don't we just begin our dialogue today by, I'd just love to hear your story uh, of, uh, of how you, um, you know, grew, grew up and what attracted your interest in economics, what was your entry point in economics, uh, because I would love to explore uh, the evolution of your thinking uh, in economics, because you've been at it uh, for a very long time. Thank you so much, Jim. It is so wonderful to be with you again <laughs> after so many years. <laughs> and hello, everybody. Um, I um, really began as um, a child in growing up in Britain, totally in love with nature. And uh, my mother grew all of our own food without uh, pesticides and all of that kind of thing. And I, so I grew up knowing that nature was totally abundant and we lived in an abundant universe with all those free photons coming in from the sun. And of course, so many indigenous people all over the world rightly worship the sun, which is the source of all life uh, on the biosphere in this planet. And so I grew up um, with that kind of um, uh, perspective, um, the perspective that human beings were um, in an abundant, on an abundant planet. And if they cooperated with each other, 
um, and understood the true conditions of our livelihoods, which was harvesting those free photons that came every day from our mother star, we would be just fine. And, uh, and so as I got more and more involved uh, and uh, moved to the United States, became a US citizen in 1963, I discovered in New York City, uh, the air pollution, which had back in uh, London 10 years earlier, uh, caused the death of thousands of people from the coal smoke that came from generating the Brits electricity. And I thought, oh my Lord, the same thing is going to happen in New York. And so I got together with a group of mothers in the play park. Uh, my daughter at that point was two years old. And we saw all of the belching smokestacks of the electric utility, um, consolidated Edison all over the place. And we saw that almost every little brownstone house in New York City uh, kind of cooked its garbage um, very uh, inefficiently and added this um, air pollution uh, really at the street level. And I kept on thinking, you know, uh, pushing my uh, daughter around in a stroller, uh, that she was right there inhaling all of the uh, exhaust from the automobiles, uh, even though in New York City back in the 1960s, many of the delivery trucks were still electric and clean. And so uh, these were the kind of issues that uh, got me to think very seriously about what was wrong with economics. So my whole approach to economics has always been about trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And so my first book, uh, which came out in 1978, was called Creating Alternative Futures, The End of Economics. And to my delight, my British friend by that time, E.F. Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful, agreed to write the foreword to that book. And he and I went all around the US in 1973 to promote his book, Small is Beautiful, to sell out crowds everywhere. <laughs> and so he just loved it when I blurted out from the stage of all of these various universities where we were lecturing, that um, economics was actually a form of brain damage. And it was really politics in disguise. And so my next book, um, after uh, I became, and this is a too long a story, I became a science advisor in Washington, DC to a new office set up by Congress called the Office of Technology Assessment. Mm -hmm. And they were questioning the same things I was questioning. Why did we generate electricity, which was poisoning our lungs? Why did we have automobiles, which could be clean and electric, as we knew how to do, uh, where we had opted for these fossil fuel internal combustion engines, which really belonged in the Smithsonian? So basically, uh, I have always had that particular approach. And uh, funnily enough, uh, Kate Rayworth and I last week um, met uh, for the first time on the webinar we did together. And we compared notes and she had discovered my now well-known cake diagram, um, which saw the total society um, as a three layer cake with icing on the top, the top <laughs> layer being the private sector, all, and then that rests on the next layer, which is the public sector. And they are the only two sectors that the economists measure, uh, and they're conducted in, uh, in money, i.e. they're measuring always the price system. And I knew by that time that the price system was a function of human ignorance. All those, quote, external costs that they uh, wouldn't 
acknowledged in their balance sheets and passed on to my kids' lungs or to future generations. It was like a Freudian slip. And so the two layers, lower layers of the cake, the third one was what I call the love economy, which is all of that traditional golden rule based uh, societies, um, which had um, are acknowledged in all spiritual traditions of mutual aid and caring and sharing and community life and um, owner built housing, growing your own food, all of those things, but none con uh, conducted in money, of course. And then I looked at the economic textbooks and saw why. The economic textbook said that unpaid volunteer work was uh, irrational and that the only rational behavior for human beings was selfish, competitive, um, win or, or, or win-lose conflict with all others over what they thought were scarce resources. And so that uh, made me realize that they didn't realize that the resources at the bottom layer were nature's resources. They weren't scarce. They were available, but we were using them completely wrongly, digging in the earth um, for mining fossil fuels instead of harvesting the free photons. And so that was my cake. And Kate said that she had stumbled on my cake in 1996 and she had it stuck up in her office wall and it, it helped along with Herman Daly's um, visuals and others to, for her to update it and expand it with what we now know scientifically uh, that John Rockström, John Johann Rockström put together in what he calls the nine planetary boundaries. So Kate and I had an epiphany last month. And so, so please don't think of me as an economist. I've always been a global futurist and many have called me an anti-economist. <laughs> <laughs> well put, well put. And in terms of your uh, being a futurist, uh, you know, you were a good friend of John Nesbitt's that when I uh, mm -hmm. first uh, met you back during uh, the Gorbachev days with the State of the World Forum. Yes. Uh, John Nesbitt, uh, who wrote uh, Megatrends uh, back, I think, in the early 1980s, um, uh, knew you and spoke so highly of you and uh, he was another one who, who really had a capacity to look into the, the future and see the trends, the mega trends that were emerging all around us, but were invisible because we were, we were basically fixated on the past. Yes. Um, so, um, so your 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 uh, your training and your self identity is is much more as a futurist than as an economist. Yes. And I, I ended up, strangely enough, even though I never went to college, I had to learn by experience, uh, but I ended up with four honorary PhDs <laughs> from very respected organizations without incurring any student debt and without wasting four years of my life learning a lot of obsolete uh, stuff. Uh, because, of course, uh, it's very hard for university courses to keep ahead with the accelerated pace of global change today. So what I found was that uh, the best thing to do was really to focus on what was wrong with GDP measuring the, as, as we all were told, and the media and all of the economic textbooks, that was the holy grail was uh, money measured economic growth. And so I, I made that a target. And uh, back in um, 2003, I had my first opportunity in Brazil um, after President Lula was elected. We put on a conference call in Curitiba, which is a very advanced city in Southern Brazil.
And the Chamber of Commerce there and all of the business community that had backed Lula uh, helped us put together this conference, which we called the first international conference on implementing indicators of quality of life and sustainability. And we brought together statisticians from all over the world who had been kicked down into the basement of their various um, official statistical offices because they were measuring the health, education, quality of life, uh, poverty gaps, and environmental uh, indicators which are left out of GDP. And so 700 of these statisticians all came together in this magnificent building in Curitiba. And I wrote all about it uh, and I called it Statisticians of the World Unite. <laughs> and it's still on my uh, archive, which is hazelhenderson.com. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, let's uh, let's explore a little bit more deeply uh, the mythology around GDP and this notion that I think is very important uh, that you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks that economics is really politics by another guise. Um, it's not economics really at all. It's our political orientation around how we extract resources and deploy them uh, in society. Uh, say a little bit more, uh, you know, cause you've spent a lot of time uh, critiquing um, uh, this whole notion. Um, just lead us through so that uh, people understand it more comprehensively, um, the, the, the fallacies around the GDP. Well, basically um, because all of the macroeconomic metrics which govern our lives and are reported every day in the mass media from GDP to the uh, indicators of uh, inflation and debt and unemployment and all the rest of it. Um, that's all the province of GDP. And the, uh, the, the extent to which it, it's driving us over the cliff because it informs all those macroeconomic models which inform finance and um, maximizing money income while ignoring all of the so-called externalities, the social and environmental costs, which now are, you know, from pandemics to climate change, to floods, to hurricanes, to fires, you know, whatever, is all uh, externalized from the GDP view of progress. And when I first wrote about this in Creating Alternative Futures, well, actually I wrote about it earlier than that, because uh, that, um, that book, which came out in 1978, is a composite of many articles I wrote in the Harvard Business Review. I got written up in the New York Times trying to make this point, you know, that what we had going here was basically economists versus ecologists. And the ecologists were looking at the whole global um, picture and the biosphere and all the problems the economists and the financial system was creating. And basically, uh, the Cold War about all these labels, communism, capitalism, socialism, um, you know, uh, libertarianism, anarchism, whatever you want, uh, it comes down really to the weaponizing of the price system. And using prices, which, as I said, are a function of human ignorance, as the be all and end all of all of the basis of those statistics, and now deeply buried in financial algorithms. And as you know, Jim, most of the trading now of uh, stocks on Wall Street and everywhere else are conducted. Uh, by computers in algorithms, um, which are these assumptions are deeply buried um, and we don't question them because, oh my gosh, it's mathematics and it's quote unquote artificial intelligence. There's no such thing as artificial intelligence. We train those machines. And I wrote an article a few years ago called, let's train humans 
before we train machines. Mm. Because we have to recognize our own agency. The moment we think it's, oh, it's too late now, you know, it's the artificial intelligence or the other thing, you know, oh, we have all of the internet of things and we have our crop pots um, con connected to the internet and we can't get into our homes if we forget the code, uh, we get shut out and all this. And I wrote an article uh, a few years ago called The Idiocy of Things. Why on earth do we want our kettles and our crock pots are, are connected to the internet. Of course we don't. It's made us more vulnerable. We now know with all these hackers and all of this uh, ransomware that we've only made ourselves more, uh, more vulnerable. So basically what happened when I wrote about all of this uh, in politics, in um, creating alternative futures, which is now a free download um, it was republished by the University of Florida Press and us, and it's on our website as a free download. And what happened when, I, when that book came out was all of these religious leaders in the US came to me and they were inviting me to speak, um, to keynote their annual meetings with thousands of people. You know, I can remember keynoting a Catholic conference at... Um, I think it was at uh, Purdue, um, uh, or it could have been, no, no, I think it was Purdue. And I, I was terrified, there were 1,000, 10,000 people there. And uh, all they wanted me to reiterate was what I'd said in that book about economics being a form of politics in disguise. And I said, actually, the um, price denominated model, the economic model, uh, actually incentivizes the seven deadly sins. Incentivizes them. Greed, acquisition, envy, conflict, competition, you name it. And, uh, and I, that's all they wanted to hear. And I was saying, you guys, whatever the religious tradition, I spoke to, to all of them that, those years. Uh, why don't we remember the deeper code of mutual respect and mutual aid that we all live by before those economic textbooks and before they weaponize money. And that is the golden rule. Mm. Mm. Well, that uh, uh, leads us to the Chicago School and Milton Friedman and, and uh, neoliberal economics uh, if there's an economic system that honors and incentivizes the, the seven deadly vices, uh, it would be neoliberal economics, I would say. Uh, exactly. With, with, a, with a vengeance. Exactly. And with arrogance, yes. uh, that uh, is still embraced uh, essentially worldwide by our international uh, institutions, uh, certainly. Uh, the major sort of G7, G, G20 governments. Um, uh, explain to all of us a little bit more about how you, you understand neoliberal economics. And because this is ultimately politics, uh, Hazel, how is it that something that honors and incentivizes the seven deadly vices has been embraced globally uh, almost without reservation? Well, it's not by accident, actually, because um, what I discovered, particularly the six years I was in Washington as a science advisor to the Office of Technology Assessment, is I saw up close and personal how the incumbent industries of the 19th and 20th century, which were all based on resource extraction, oil, coal, um, you know, petroleum, uh, the mining, minerals and all of that uh, were basically um, the, all of the fortunes um, of that, those particular uh, stages of the industrial revolution um, had uh, accumulated enormous uh, money power. And they immediately began to deploy it in the 1960s um, when uh, the famous Lewis Powell memorandum 
uh, was sent around and, and he was with, uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce kind of, you know, groupings. And he was saying, look, uh, there's all of these citizens groups that are getting active, like I was Citizens for Clean Air. And um, they are all um, lobbying the Congress. And we have to keep our mandate to be able to continue with this uh, economic model based on only prices and uh, not having to account for all of the external costs uh, and environmental impacts we create. So the Lewis Powell memo said, um, we must now really uh, get political and we must fund all of these uh, uh, colleges and, in, and universities like the University of Chicago, George Mason, all the universities in the US have to be uh, have a unit funded which promotes this neoclassical uh, narrow economic GDP measured uh, growth economic growth model and of course it was very much based on Milton Friedman's uh, 1970 paper uh, which they all bought into that the only social responsibility business had was to make money for the shareholders, forget about everybody else. And of course, that was um, pervade in Latin America and uh, all eventually uh, all over the world. And we're still dealing with the consequence of that money means. It goes way beyond the idea of capitalism. You've got to dig deeper and look at the politics of money creation and credit allocation. And all of our, my work now is focused really on bringing stress and pressure to bear on central banks because people don't understand, uh, although many more do now understand, thanks to the good work of citizens groups like Positive Money in London and in, uh, Belgium, in uh, Brussels. And basically, uh, we have to get people to understand that uh, central banks create money out of thin air um, and they empower their, their commercial banking system to create that money, uh, give them the authority to do that um, whenever they make a loan. Um, all they do, if you go in to get a mortgage, uh, say, of $100,000, and the bank says, okay, we'll give you this mortgage, and all that happens is that the bank writes in an entry into your account of $100,000. Um, of course, they don't. Um, and then they charge, not only did they create that out of thin air, but then they also charge you interest on it. So uh, and so we did a television program, which anyone can watch on ethicalmarkets.tv, and we, uh, we uplinked it on uh, satellite to all the PBS stations, and about half the PBS stations have played it several times, and it's called The Money Fix, and it explains this amazing way that our money is created. And we interviewed a lot of people on the street, you know, asking them, where do you think money comes from? Oh, well, you know, I don't care just as long as it's in my paycheck. And then one young lady said, she said, I think it's, in, it's created in a big factory in order to control us. <laughs> and she was nearer to the truth. And so what's happening now is that the really good work that NGOs are doing and that we support 100% is we're going to central banks like Christine Lagarde at the European Central Bank and Andrew Bailey, the new head of the Bank of England, and saying, come on, no more um, quantitative easing where you guys are buying up dud mortgages and leading to this housing bubble which may burst again. This is ridiculous um, that we uh, want you to look at your entire asset account and uh, to disinvest in all of the, um, the uh, instruments based on fossil fuels and begin what we all call green quantitative easing, only by 
green bonds that are fully certified and the bonds of the new generation of companies, the 21st century companies in solar, wind, energy efficiency, batteries, um, electric cars, LED lighting, all of the companies now um, producing the new, the next, the next economy um, that, that of course um, is very hotly debated now in the USA and in Europe um, as this green deal, green new deal. And we know from all of the research that we have been covering for over a decade in our green transition scoreboard, also free download, we do it every year, um, there's now 10.3 trillion of private investments in all of these green companies, and they've suddenly become the darlings of the stock market. So thank God I can, I don't have to stop. I can stop doing that now. Don't need to do that anymore because Bloomberg Green is doing it every Saturday and Sunday morning, and you can get it on your uh, email. Uh, the Financial Times is covering it. The Economist is covering it. So my job is done now. I can go on researching additional problems, uh, which we like to pay attention to issues which are underreported and also need a greater focus. And are you finding your, your discussions with the central banks, are they going anywhere? Uh, are they uh, stonewalling you? I mean, what's, what's the impact of this focus on the central banks? They are definitely responding. We're not doing it uh, personally. We are working through and promoting all of the NGOs, particularly positive money, um, in London and, and uh, Brussels, um, who are actually trotting into these central banks uh, personally and Oops. Uh, I think you froze, uh, Hazel. We've lost, we lost Hazel. <clears throat> Hopefully she'll come back in in a second. Hang in there, everyone. Hazel will be back. Did we lose the connection, Rick? And she's just frozen, or she? No, it's something at her end, Jim. Yeah. Um, she, she's she might just pop back in again. Hi, Hazel. We lost you for a second. Oh, we okay. yeah, oh, we left oh, off you on. There you you're are. going to new issues. Yeah. Oh, so. Am I back now? Yeah, you're back and you you cut out Hazel right at the point where you said that uh, you were working with and supporting sort of intermediaries in these discussions with the- uh, Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we're reporting, we are the mission of Ethical Markets Media, which takes no advertising and which I pretty much fund from the royalties from our TV shows, which are uh, used in uh, classrooms all over the world. Um, distributed by films.com and uh, basically from my books, which are now in 800 libraries in God knows how many countries. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and so uh, basically uh, what we, uh, and we are just committed to trying to tell the issues as clearly and present the facts as clearly as we can. And uh, uh, you'll find that most economic textbooks kind of um, gloss over this politics of money creation. They don't mm. give you the full story. If people really knew that money was created out of thin air and we allowed the banks to do it and to then to make money by charging us interest as well, um, you know, there might be a, a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> At least there should be a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, what about what, the, uh, there's another uh, example, Jim, um, mm -hmm. which might be helpful, and that is that um, GDP right now, uh, GDP because it doesn't have an asset side, um, it only ha it only records the debt 
In other words, it records the investments that governments are making um, in green infrastructure and the new infrastructure we need of child care and properly funded uh, health care and mental health and all of these things, which are the infrastructure, the knowledge info structure uh, of um, advanced green societies. Um, all of those investments going into broadband and whatever are all recorded faithfully as debt in GDP. And therefore every country's debt to GDP ratio is overstated by about 50% because they don't have the corresponding assets that were created on the other side of the balance sheet, um, many of which last for hundreds of years. And um, so this, uh, this issue is still very much alive. And imagine if these country politicians that are, you know, they're being um, de devalued on Wall Street because, oh, they have a debt to GDP ratio of 100%. Oh my gosh, how terrible, you know, our children are gonna have all these problems, you know, all that stuff. And um, basically, um, if they were corrected by putting the assets that they created on the other side of the balance sheet, as normal uh, double you know, accounting does, uh, you could cut all of these countries' uh, debt to GDP ratios by 50% uh, with a few keystrokes. That's mm. how crazy it is, Jim. Mm. 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 Uh... And it's embraced so universally. That's the, the oh, puzzling yeah. thing. It's like everybody's in the in on the con. Yes. <laughs> and it isn't even that. It's unconscious. It, it, they're not in on a con. It's completely unconscious. Just yeah. like fish can't describe water that they're swimming in. Uh, most policymakers and decision makers in companies and government agencies never question how the price system is driving their lives and whether there aren't other values more important than prices. Um, you know, because um, all we're getting to now is that some honest economists um, la uh, like Stern in uh, his recent book, uh, points out that climate change um, is the largest market failure in human history. And a lot of economists are beginning to, to fess up to all the market failures. And see, uh, there's nothing wrong with money or markets. They were two wonderful tools that human beings have been using for centuries. The money might have been shells, it might have been wampum or knotted string or cattle or whatever. And the markets were generally in villages and local communities or the, um, the long network market, say, of North American people all over North America, Native Americans, who traded from coast to coast, all kinds of things they thought were valuable, you know, from shells and pots and uh, all uh, feathers and all kinds of things that were the money uh, of that time. So it's just that these two wonderful tools um, you have to be very careful where they work and where they cause market failures. And actually, Adam Smith, in his first book in 1757, was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it was all about mutual aid and mutual respect and how communities should live together. Um, very much an ethical kind of... Um, uh, you know, golden rule sort of view of things. And it was only 10 years later that he turned his attention to what had happened when markets were made national, like in Britain, uh, which Carl, um, Carl Polanyi wrote about in The Great Transformation, where as a matter of law, markets were installed as the international kind of standard. And so he wrote The Wealth of Nations to describe how markets worked at that level. But he always said that markets could only work 
if buyers and sellers had equal information and no unfortunate circumstances were visited on innocent bystanders. Uh, to give you an example of a market failure today in the USA, it is our healthcare, uh, our medical allopathic medical system. Um, and it cannot be a market because it doesn't meet the conditions that Adam Smith set forth for a market. Because the buyers, that is, they call us patients, um, we have no power and, and, and almost no information. And the sellers have all the power and all the information. So, so that means per se, it cannot be a market. Um, it has to be legislated in some way and paid for with general taxes and public options. And we have to understand, particularly in this country, that this overriding norm of individualism, the I, you know, it's me, has to also include we. And so what the work you're doing and all of the people on this wonderful network, we are trying to integrate the me and the we again. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Um, uh, there's a, a, a number of questions in the chat, uh, one of which is around Bitcoin and these new cryptocurrencies. What's your understanding and measure of, of uh, the cryptocurrencies? Well, the, I've been uh, commenting on Bitcoin for many years. After it first came out, I said, well, um, mining Bitcoin, um, we now know uses enough electricity, the same amount of electricity as a country the size of Switzerland or, or Ireland. And so it's producing an enormous amount of CO2 pollution. That's the first problem. The second problem is uh, I always refer to it as Bitcoin because uh, you, you know those shiny little pictures of coins with the B on them? That's fake video. There is no such thing. Bitcoin is simply a string of digits in a computer somewhere, in an electronic wallet somewhere, and if you pull the plug on the electricity, it's gone. That's all Bitcoin is. <laughs> so, it, of course, it's the speculative currency, just like tulips were in Holland in the 17th century. So you're, you're, you, you don't value Bitcoin. You wouldn't advise anybody to invest in any of these cryptocurrencies. Uh, well, it's just the greater uh, fool. It's the greater fool theory. Um, you can only, you see, you can't use it to buy stuff or transact stuff. Everybody knows that's far too slow and cumbersome and stupid. Better to use your credit card. So everybody knows that. But it's just the greater fuel full theory. You think it'll go up so you can sell it to some other person. That, that's the only reason people buy Bitcoin or any of the other currencies that are now about 1,500 of them traded on Coinbase, which just went public itself. And that's nonsense on stilts. You know, the Coinbase went public um, and is now valued, you know, in, in the, I can't remember, 80 billion or something. You know, it's not producing anything. Um, it, it's, uh, this is all hot air. And so um, it's just to try to um, bring it down to earth, we do partner with one currency, which is on those boards, and that is called Solar Coin. And solarcoin.org is a, a rewards currency. It's run by a foundation. And you can only get a solar coin um, if you can um, verify with a third party verification that you actually generated solar electricity. And if you generated um, a kilowatt of, social, uh, of, ele of solar electricity on your roof, or your factory roof, um, you can apply uh, to receive a solar coin reward. And the, the guy who uh, co-invented uh, solar coin um, is basically uh, on our advisory board 
is a very thoughtful guy that came out of one of the most successful hedge funds in the world, Bridgewater. And he decided that all of this price system denominated stuff was um, all um, you know, hot air. And he went back to Columbia University and got himself a PhD in biology. And he wrote a book called The Nature of Value, which is Columbia University Press 2012. And I recommend it to anyone um, who wants to straighten themselves out on this misuse of the price system. Mm, mm. But of course, you know, there, there are lots of alternative currencies uh, out there. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons why people have been enamored of the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies, the impulse um, uh, coming out of the uh, economic collapse in, in uh, 2007 was to somehow get out of the dollar denominated current yes. uh, system, which is corrupted beyond measure. Yes. Kind of create and that's, a, that's, the best, that's the best reason um, for seeing cryptocurrencies and the emergence of all of this right. as an opportunity to clarify um, our vision about the nature of money itself. And so it has been very useful um, it, for that purpose. Uh, and the, the only thing now is that people, see the whole thing is that markets only work with trust. And so, okay, you don't trust fiat currencies. You realize that governments just basically print the stuff and uh, um, it's what we will accept. Uh, and we realize because of the emergence of cryptocurrencies, what currencies really are. All currencies are is social protocols. Um, and they are tokens of the various values of various cultures and people and groups. And they're on platforms on the internet and their, their actual um, money price uh, fluctuates to the extent that people trust them. Mm -hmm. That's all, period. Yeah, yeah. But it's a, uh, uh, I'd like to hear you speak to this deeper issue of wanting to get out of the current system. You know, for example, during the Great Depression, when uh, the stock market had crashed and and people were unemployed and uh, uh, brokers were committing suicide and Wall Street and so forth. What took place around the United States was, was hundreds and se in fact, several thousand alternative currencies where communities would come together largely around barter, but it was an attempt um, like the transition movement to go off grid. Exactly, and uh, I have uh, covered local currencies for decades right. in, in, in all of my books going back 30 years. I have covered um, the emergence of local currencies as an indicator of how bad the central government was operating the, the system. And so uh, the local currencies are extremely important um, but they have to be um, centered really in a trusting community. The ones that don't work and fall apart. And Susan Witt, who helped create Berkshires um, at Schumacher, the Schumacher Society in Great Barrington, um, that's one of the longest lasting um, local currencies. And it's accepted by all of the banks. Uh, in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. It's interchangeable with the US dollar. And this is a very important way for local communities, um, if they're being starved um, by the current system and the way the plumbing works to every time the central bank does quantitative easing, the way the plumbing is set up, it goes straight back to Wall Street um, into asset bubbles. It never, trickles down, as the textbook right. said, to the, to the local, the real economy on the ground. So there is a, a great uh, importance that local currencies can uh, clear their own markets and match their own citizens to their own local needs. And of course, Curitiba, Brazil, was where a lot of this started with the mayor, uh, Jamie Lerner, 
who then became the governor and has just passed away. But I think that uh, we have in our uh, TV show, we do the other half of the program. The first half is on the politics of money creation as it is. Uh, and the second half is all local currencies and barter systems and credit uh, circles and all of the alternatives. So you're absolutely right. And so um, we, we never really needed uh, to fly off into this crypto stuff, except that everybody got enamored of blockchain. Mm. And what the, the question they don't ask is who owns the blockchain? Who gets to determine the forking of the blockchain? and the changing of the rules of the blockchain. So you see, you have trust always comes back into the equation. <laughs> and there's no opting out anymore. I mean, look at Peter Thiel and, and um, Silicon Valley um, types like him who think, well, I'm going to go and uh, buy an island and I'm going to have my own society. And they don't think about uh, sea level rise their island is going to be underwater or else Jeff Bezos and um, these others, you know, um, who want to Elon Musk, um, they want to get off the planet, you know, and terraform Mars. Um, come on, you know, we are all in this boat together. And it, it's no point asking all the time which end of the boat is sinking or whether I have some individual uh, flight out of it. None of us are going to get out of it. We, we're going to have to cooperate and share and face up to the facts um, and create the abundant society that's clearly waiting for us. Yes, yes. Well, that leads into a, uh, an area that I want to explore with you, Hazel, because uh, you just, I think, described the, metaphorically the current state of planet Earth, that we're in crisis uh, the boat uh, is sinking. Um, uh, the robber barons like uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Bill Gates are at one end of the boat, yeah. uh, rapaciously exploiting uh, everyone they can find, um, uh, looking to go out into outer space. Um, uh, and yet the boat is sinking rapidly. Um, now, as you view the current situation now, I've, you know, we've been in the pandemic now for, I was officially declared in March, uh, I think 11th by the World Health Organization as a pandemic. <clears throat> so uh, 16, 17 months later, uh, as you view the world situation, where do you see the most critical areas that we need to address and how what, what are the priorities that you if you were sitting down with uh uh you know president biden or the head of uh uh the world bank what would you tell them would be the priorities uh of uh rectifying our situation as the boat sinks well luckily um, what we've been tracking in our Green Transition Scoreboard um, was the first step, and that is to end fossil fuels and shift to renewably resourced circular economies. So that is now um, mainstream. Um, and as The Economist pointed out a couple of issues ago, um, these green stocks now are getting double digit returns and everybody is, you know, so excited about them. And are they becoming a bubble? Well, there was one area that I realized was not um, being properly paid attention to, which was a huge opportunity. And it is concerned with the fact that our current system, uh, all of our food supply which is mostly now mechanized agriculture um, and um, agrochemical uh, and uh, junk food kind of um, food system is all based on the planet's 3% of fresh water. And yet 
pull back and take a wide shot. And the planet, this planet is the water planet. 97% of the water on this planet is saline. And nature in her wisdom has created um, a salt loving uh, alternative plant kingdom. And there are hundreds of nutritious salt loving plants that could replace so much of the food supply um, that is bad for us. It's based on, you know, too much meat and, you know, all of the things that we know is wrong with junk food and monoculture and trading our food in commodity trading markets and uh, nothing to do with nutrition and all of that. So the only halophyte, it's called halophytes. And if you go to our website, um, there is a page called halophytes and you can click on it, learn all about halophyte foods, um, why they're so nutritious, they're complete proteins and they have a perfect mineral profile for humans. And the only one so far, which has actually made it into our supermarkets, mostly around the world is quinoa. And quinoa grows wild on the salt flats around Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. And in, 19, in 2013, the UN declared the year of quinoa because it does grow, you know, all over the world. And not only is it a wonderful source of human nutrition, but guess what? It has these very deep roots uh, which capture uh, ambient CO2 in the air and restores it through the roots uh, into the soil, nourishing our soils. So that is the best carbon capture uh, technology that we can use. It's even better than old growth forests because guess what? It grows so fast. And along with uh, kelp, which is now being farmed um, all over the world in the oceans as it has been for centuries. So. Um, salt loving halophyte plants have been grown and eaten in 22 countries uh, for centuries. And all we have to do is bring them to market. And that way uh, we can prevent massive starvation, which, uh, and of course, water shortages, fresh water shortages, which are occurring all over the world. And we can conserve the fresh water for human drinking, uh, rather than use it all on uh, um, agriculture, watering and irrigating these unhealthy monoculture plants. So I have been lucky enough to get that idea through to um, the science advisor and the new group around uh, President Biden. And also another high priority for me is to reinvigorate um, the Office of Technology Assessment, where we did all of these studies of what was wrong with uh, the current um, technological uh, furniture around us based on fossil fuels. And we did all of these studies about how we could shift to electric cars, we could shift to organic agriculture, uh, we could shift uh, in so many different ways. And basically, we uh, upset so many special interests. The office was started in 1974. I was a founding member of its advisory council, along with other assorted Nobel Prize winning scientists and the president of Dow Chemical and, uh, uh, and of MIT and Caltech and whatever, what have you. And uh, basically, um, when the Republicans took over the Congress in 1996 uh, with the contract on America, they shut OTA down and slew the messenger. But we have all of the studies that we did, including one that um, I shepherded along in 1980, um, in the last year that I was there, called Assessing Technologies for Local Development. And uh, we were looking at farmers markets, local currencies, um, uh, community-owned wind and solar energy, 
um, electric public transportation, uh, pedestrians, um, contract agriculture, <laughs> uh, all of the things that, that now have reemerged um, and were suppressed for 30 years. Mm. Mm. Uh, when... That's a free download. Um, that whole report is a free download at ethicalmarkets.com. So you're trying to re resurrect the OTA. Yes. That's amazing. Yes, uh, and there are many people, uh, including 40 members of Congress. And the reason they want to resurrect OTA um, is because of all of the hearings they had with Mark Zuckerberg and people uh, from the social media giants um, who made utter fools of the members of Congress because they kept asking dumb questions. And they obviously didn't know how the business models of these companies work, that they were based on advertising and they were based on algorithms designed to addict the users. And they were based on selling people's private information to data brokers and advertisers. And because they had no idea how these companies actually functioned, um, what happened was the New York, the Washington Post ran an article um, called, why is Congress so dumb? And you see, when we were at OTA, um, whatever the technological issue that was coming up for hearings, we would present a one page or two page cheat sheet um, and talking points so that at least the members of Congress have so many other priorities um, could get a quick uh, update mm. of what that technology under discussion was all about and the right questions to ask. So they, these are the members of Congress now who say, oh, yes, my God, um, let's, let's reboot OTA. It's still authorized. All we have to do um, is to put a modest amount of money in it. It's very inexpensive because all of the studies were done um, by getting the best research um, from all of the universities and think tanks around the world, but also, of course, in the USA, mostly in North America. So, yes, let's reboot OTA. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, speaking of the, uh, the technology companies and the, the real architecture of Facebook and Google and so forth and so on, you know, they, they are uh, creating silos in the public consciousness where reality becomes so fractured that the discernment of truth becomes a, an essential practical impossibility. Yes. So they, you know, I, and the Republican Party, as you know, from Trump and and the big lie around the 2020 election, we have a whole major political party in the United States that is establishing its raison d'etre on a conscious falsehood that's enabling them to engage in the politics of voter suppression for political expediency. So you not only have a situation where you know, they're suppressing uh, like technology assessment, they're, they're suppressing uh, now democracy itself for political aims. It's oh, yes. It's an extraordinary situation uh, in which we yes. find ourselves, Hazel. You know, it is extraordinary. I mean, uh, I, as a native of uh, Britain, soon to be little England, I think, rather than Great Britain, um, and probably that's a good thing. But uh, I became a naturalized American system, a citizen in 1963 because uh, I really uh, believed in the American dream. And this country has been so good to me. And uh, I don't know of many people anywhere in the world um, who can find a better system um, to live under with all its uh, challenges and all these new problems created by social media. Uh, we have to address them. I mean, we have to repeal Section 230 of the, of the Federal Communications Bill Act of 1996. There's a whole lot of very simple things. I set out five simple steps um, to uh, rein in social media including, of course, what's happening now is breaking them up. There's nothing wrong with breaking companies up. 
Um, we broke up AT&T. We created five baby bells, hundreds of new technologies, hundreds of new jobs. Um, it's good for competition. And uh, Amy Klobuchar has been writing in her wonderful book, Antitrust, giving 200 years of examples of how we have always had to fight against the powerful and um, ways that the powerful can weaponize ideas, they can weaponize prices, they can weaponize markets, they can weaponize uh, college education courses um, to accumulate um, their own monopoly positions. So that's always going to be with us. And um, Asimov Glu uh, writes about that in his wonderful book, uh, Why Nations Fail. And it's always that desire of one group or two or three groups in a population who are power seekers rather than um, with the democratic ideals that are in our wonderful constitution, even though it too has, of course, its failings. But uh, this country um, is my beloved country and uh, I am working as hard as I know how uh, to restore uh, and enhance our democracy. Mm. Mm. Well, I think we all are, and I think it's a it's a moment of deep concern uh, at every level, whether it's ecology, economics, politics. We're witnessing uh, the fragility of institutions that have been built in many cases over over centuries. Uh, and one of the, I think the effects of the pandemic has been to shatter um, the basic trust that people had in the institutions that before the pandemic, they thought were not only normal, but were going to last indefinitely into the future. And within literally weeks, you know, we were under lockdown, we were uh, wearing masks, we were engaging in social distancing, we weren't traveling, economies were shut down, uh, people were unemployed. Um, and that, I would say, shock still reverberates uh, through the system. And, and the response has been, a, uh, uh, I would say, a, a visceral rise in authoritarianism, uh, but also um, a, a breakdown in the public publicly accepted matrix of, of, of interaction and interchange. Um, yeah. So, uh, and it's right at a moment when the boat's sinking and we need everybody on the boat to get it together and come together with one accord uh, to save ourselves. And really that uh, this is the promise um, of the Biden presidency is that uh, he did very early in the game realized that addressing the pandemic uh, would be the only way to bring the economy back. And to bring the economy back, you have to make money, which is what runs the current economy, you have to make money available at the bottom of the heap, the people who will spend it into the economy. And this is the theory behind uh, universal basic income. Um, it's not charity. Um, it's that in a society like uh, ours or all advanced economies who uh, use money as the basic um, metaphor of control, um, you have to make sure that when you do tax cuts and when you do any kind of uh, policy change, um, the money must be directed to those people who will immediately spend it into the economy to keep up the purchasing power. Uh, and so uh, that, uh, it, it, as economists call it, aggregate demand. And so the fact that we got that bill through very quickly on a pretty bipartisan basis right uh, earlier this year uh, was what accounted for the fact that we are now um, in a much better uh, shape, even though we haven't yet fully corrected the economic model. Um, it, it's a matter of shifting the money tokens and the money metaphor away from the past and away from those wealthy people who immediately send it offshore 
to tax havens or buy back their own stock as they did with uh, Trump's tax cut in 2017, you have to push it down uh, so that not only does it go to the people who need it most and will spend it, but also shift it forward from the fossilized sectors of the 19th century um, into the 21st century green economies. Um, and this can be done without lots more um, R&D. And Bill Gates has fallen down on the job with his last book. Um, and, and basically, you know, talking about a smaller versions of nuclear power and all of this, um, as market players say, he's talking his book. In other words, he has a venture capital group called Breakthrough Technologies or something like that. All the old guys in Silicon Valley that gave us the mistaken models of social media and who are messing around with Bitcoin. Um, don't trust those people. Um, you know, clearly um, we have to go with the Biden model, which is um, we will create more equality and uh, we will balance this economy um, by, from, the, from the ground up uh, rather than expecting that the top down, the, the so-called trickling down will somehow save us. It never has, it never will. And it's now got to be bottom up and trickle up. Thank you, Hazel. Bottom up and trickle up everyone uh, in alignment with natural systems. Uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, Hazel, thank you so much uh, for your time and your wisdom today. Uh, you've been an inspiration to me since uh, I first met you and for many, many people around the world. So we wish you all strength as you continue to uh, campaign on a daily basis to bring the world to its senses uh, so that we can right the boat and sail onwards into the futures. And uh, wow. it's people like you that show the way. Well, the feeling I have about you, Jim, is mutual. And I thank you for all of your wonderful service to our common future for so many years. And let's keep moving together. And I have been honored to participate in this. And so all my best to you and to everybody on this uh, Zoom call. Take thank care. You. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll bring it to a close now. And just as a reminder, tomorrow, we're gonna to move to uh, Northern England and Southern Scotland to the Caledonian forest. And we're gonna talk with one of the great ecologists of Great Britain, uh, Alan Featherstone, who has been working for many, many years to preserve uh, the Caledonian forest. And he's gonna tell us that story. So that's tomorrow on Humanity Rising, same time, same station. Uh, thank you everyone and Hazel, Thank you so much. Godspeed and much love. Thank you. Bye. Take care to all.